Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today for the next part of the Yale 20 lecture series. My name is uh, Jan Beversdorf. I'm one of the residents in the Yale Internal Medicine Residency Program, and I um, composed this uh, talk today on deep venous thrombosis with one of our hematology faculty members, Alfred Lee, who is an incredible teacher and mentor and who helped me compiling this talk today. So as for all the other Yale 20 lecture series, we do have a um, workflow consisting of the five minute bedside assessment followed by the, the diagnosis and the treatment of deep venous thrombosis before we conclude with the assessment and plan and some key take home points uh, conclude this video. To get started with the five minute bedside assessment, when you're approaching a patient with a DVT, you always want to ask yourself the question, does my patient actually have a DVT or how likely is this patient to have a DVT? And there are several risk prediction scores out there. The most commonly used one is the WELL score and we're going to discuss that score in a greater detail later in the talk. The second question, not only for a patient with DVT is, how sick is my patient and what is the appropriate uh, disposition plan for that patient? And key factors you uh, want to assess uh, to answer this question is, is my patient hemodynamically stable? You look at the vital signs, you take comorbidities into account, and especially for DVT, you want to check peripheral pulses because if you don't have any peripheral pulses, that could be a potentially uh, life-threatening situation and this patient might be a candidate for thrombolysis. Based on these concerns, um, you want to come up with a disposition plan. If you decide that my patient is a candidate for thrombolysis, that patient has to go for at least 24 hours to the ICU or at least to a step-down unit. Most other patients can actually be managed as outpatients. However, there are some um, considerations when you want to admit a patient to the hospital. If that patient has a high risk of bleeding when you start him on uh, anticoagulation, if that, has, uh, if that patient has severe comorbidities that would require admission to the hospital, or if that DVT is complicated by a symptomatic PE, these patients are definitely candidates you want to admit to the hospital for close observation. As you know from medical school, there's this famous worker triad that constitutes three key components and that are important for blood clot formation. Number one is altered blood flow. This basically comes down to stasis. So immobility, surgery, and anatomic risk factors like may furnace syndrome are risk factors that cause blood stasis and predispose to clot formation. The second component is vascular endothelial injury as can be seen with surgery or in chronic inflammatory state, or just a firm body within the blood vascular system, like a central venous catheter, which is a well-known risk factor for blood clot formation. The third key component is a hypercoagulable state, and that can be in the form of inherited or acquired from affiliates. As you can see from this image here, DVT is basically a clinical diagnosis. One of the key clinical findings is redness, swelling, tenderness of the involved limb. And also this clinical finding is supplemented with uh, key parts on the history. So as you can see here from the positive likelihood ratios that are presented in parentheses after the, uh, after the finding, none of these findings uh, individually is a good clinical predictor that that patient actually has a DVT. As you can see here, the best positive likelihood ratio is actually for a history of malignancy, but the positive likelihood ratio for just that one finding is only 2.7, which is not particularly great. But if you take all these risk factors into consideration, you can have a very good positive likelihood ratio that that patient actually has a DVT. So, Key factors, 
are based on history, like malignancy, previous surgery or immobilization, or a DVT or pulmonary embolism in the previous medical history. Other key clinical findings are unilateral edema and an increased lack circumference uh, of the involved limb. Also, unilateral warmth, tenderness, or erythema are findings that you want to look out for on the clinical presentation. The often cited Homan sign, which is pain with dorsiflexion of the ankle, only has a 1.4 positive likelihood ratio, which is not a particularly helpful sign. Combining these clinical and historical features ends up with the Wells score. And the Wells score basically assigns one point each uh, to key clinical findings on the history and physical exam. And the purpose of the Wells score is to basically give you a pretest probability how likely is that patient to have a DVT. So with a Wells score of less than two, a DVT is basically unlikely with a negative likelihood ratio of 0 0.25, which is very helpful to rule out a DVT. And if your well score is greater than 3, you have a positive likelihood ratio of 5.2, which is also quite helpful. However, what are differential diagnoses that you need to consider for patients with a DVT? In the study that I quote here, um, they actually did the gold standard diagnostic test for a DVT, which is a venogram on patients with a high clinical suspicion for a uh, deep venous thrombosis. And patients with a negative venogram eventually ended up in most cases with musculoskeletal injury to a leg, which accounted for 40% of these cases. Other differential diagnoses to keep in mind are venous insufficiency, lymphedema, or just a swelling in a paralyzed limb following a stroke. Less prevalent differential diagnoses are cellulitis, a Baker cyst, or other injuries to the knee. However, in a substantial proportion of patients, the eventual diagnosis is still unknown. A venogram is an invasive procedure, and we do not do it anymore today. So our new diagnostic gold standard is Doppler ultrasound of the leg. So there are several findings on ultrasound that are indicative of a clot. The most elegant way is obviously to directly visualize the blood clot in the, in the vasculature. Another key finding is uh, that veins are usually compressible while arteries are not. So if a vein on ultrasound is not compressible, that is indicative of a blood clot in the, uh, in the vein itself. Ultrasound has an exceptional high sensitivity and specificity rate for proximal DVTs, with specificity rates around a 95% rate, which is great, and also specificity around 95%. However, for a distal DVT, only three quarters are positive. So ultrasound is great for proximal DVT, to diagnose a patient with a DVT, while for more distal DVTs, ultrasound may not be conclusive. How about D-dimer? D-dimer is basically a fibrin degradation products that are increased not only in DVT and PE, but also in several other conditions like cancer or just in physiological conditions like pregnancy or age. D-dimers have a high sensitivity and therefore a high negative predictive value. So they are especially helpful if you have a low pretest probability based on your well score uh, for a DVT. And if you then end up with a negative D-dimer, that basically rules out a DVT. But with a positive D-dimer, you're stuck. You can't make a diagnosis just based on a positive D-dimer. D-dimer as a fibrin degradation product is only elevated if you have continuous um, blood clot formation and blood clot breakdown. So in an outpatient setting where DVT is more of a chronic process, D-dimers can be false negative in about 30% of cases. So what's the diagnostic algorithm we use here at Yale for a patient with a presumed diagnosis of uh, DVT? We start off with the well score to determine our pretest probability of how likely is that patient to have a DVT. If a DVT is unlikely, meaning a well score of 1 or 0, then please go ahead and order a D-dimer. If that D-dimer is negative, 
you're done, you've ruled out the DVT. However, if your well score is 2 or greater, or if you have a positive D-dimer, you will order an ultrasound of the involved extremity. If the ultrasound is positive, you've also established your diagnosis and you go ahead and treat that patient with anticoagulation or thrombolysis. If your ultrasound is negative and you've not already ordered a D-dimer, then next step would be to order a D-dimer. If that comes back positive, but the ultrasound is negative, go ahead and repeat the ultrasound in four to seven days. If D-dimer and ultrasound are negative, you're also done. You have ruled out the DVT. One of the key determinations you have to make when you approach a patient with a DVT is whether that DVT is provoked or unprovoked. Provoked meaning DVT is triggered by a transient risk factor like trauma, surgery or prolonged immobility. While unprovoked DVT means there is no major provoking factor. And distinguishing between provoked and unprovoked DVT is important for management as provoked DVTs require a shorter period of anticoagulation compared to unprovoked DVTs. A whole separate category is DVT associated with malignancy and we're going to touch on that. Several studies have shown that an unprovoked DVT could actually be the first indicator of an underlying malignancy with a one-year cancer detection rate of up to 10%. Several studies have subsequently tried to answer the question what extent of cancer screening should be done for an unprovoked DVT. A recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine could show that there is no increased utility of an CT abdomen pelvis in addition to a good history and physical exam and age and sex specific cancer screening. So you don't need to do any extensive cancer workup if you have a patient with an unprovoked DVT. How about thrombophilia screening? It's an evolving and highly controversial field. So what I'm telling you is the, the way we approach thrombophilia screening here at Yale may not be applicable to your home institution. The only consensus about thrombophilia screening is that it's not indicated for provoked DVT. But what is the utility of thrombophilia screening in unprovoked DVT? The study I'm presenting here investigated the risk of recurrence for patients with a proven thrombophilia versus patients without a thrombophilia after they discontinued a Coumadin anticoagulation after a first unprovoked DVT. And what you could basically see here, that almost up to 10 years of follow-up, there's no significant difference in the rate of DVT recurrence. So what's the utility of thrombophilia screening? Well, for certain heritable thrombophilias, the presence of that particular thrombophilia may mildly increase the risk of recurrence. However, it is not recommended to base the duration of anticoagulation on the results of thrombophilia screening, as thrombophilia testing has not been shown to reduce the risk of recurrence. However, if you want to proceed with thrombophilia testing, there are three key questions you need to answer. Number one, whom do I test? Well, it depends, and there are no strict guidelines on this question, as thrombophilia testing has not been shown to reduce the risk of DVT recurrence. However, you can consider to test patients with recurrent VTEs, patients with a part of family history or who present with VTE at a young age or in unusual locations, like the cerebral or mesenteric veins or arterial and venous thromboses. You can also consider to test for antiphospholipid syndrome in patients with pregnancy complications, which are defined in this context by Sapporo criteria as either one or more unexplained fetal deaths beyond the 10th week of gestation, or one or more preterm deliveries of a morphologically normal infant before 34 weeks of gestation due to severe preeclampsia, eclampsia, or features that are consistent with placental insufficiency, or thirdly, three or more unexplained consecutive spontaneous pregnancy losses before the 10th week of gestation. The second question is, what do I test? It would be an appropriate start to begin thrombophilia screening with testing for the five most common heritable thrombophilias, which are factor V Leiden, for which you would start with an APC resistance test first, protein C and protein S, as well as antithrombin levels and prothrombin gene mutation.
If you're suspecting antiphospholipid syndrome, you should be testing for anticaryolipin, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein, and lupus anticoagulant. However, it is important to keep in mind that all the genetic factors play a role in thrombosis development. Only a minority of patients with unprovoked VTEs has one of these five major heritable thrombophilias, which suggests that other minor genetic factors may be involved as well, which are not routinely tested for in general practice. And finally, the third question is, when do I test? Usually, we recommend to wait at least six weeks following the VTE event or childbirth. Ideally, patients should be off anticoagulation for testing, as some tests like protein C, protein S levels can be affected by concomitant anticoagulation. After we have spent a significant um, proportion of this talk on the diagnosis of DVT, let's switch gears and talk about treatment. So for distal DVT, there have actually been some studies out there that suggested that you do not need to treat them at all. And you can just follow these patients with surveillance ultrasounds. But that's still an involving field. You can consider to just observe these patients if they are asymptomatic ambulatory, or if they just have an increased risk of bleeding and you do not feel confident to start them on anticoagulation. Most cases of DVT can actually be managed as outpatients, and several studies have shown that this approach is safe and can yield better outcomes than inpatient management. However, some patients definitely need to be admitted to a hospital and managed as inpatients. Factors that you may want to take into consideration are the burden of comorbidities for these patients, if it is a massive DVT, like an approximal femoral vein, or even extending into the iliacs, or if that DVT has been complicated by symptomatic PE, or the risk of bleeding on anticoagulation is high, that you just want to observe these patients closely. The next question is, how do I treat? There are several options available nowadays. Number one is low molecular weight heparin plus warfarin. Warfarin takes a couple of days to have its full effect with an INR goal of 2.0 to 3.0. So you always want to start with low molecular weight heparin and warfarin at the same time and then discontinue low molecular weight heparin if you have a therapeutic INR. Other options are DOEX. So rivaroxaban and apixaban can actually be used as monotherapy, while for the bigger trend in doxaban, you always want to start with five days of low molecular weight heparin first. If you have a patient with renal impairment, you want to use unfractionated heparin and warfarin. For cancer patients, low molecular weight heparin, especially enoxaparin, has for a long time been the mainstay of therapy. However, recent data for DOEX like Seralto and Apixaban have also shown that these medications are safe uh, for cancer patients as well. Of note, for antiphospholipid syndrome, the only option you have is warfarin. So there is no role for heparin or DOEX in antiphospholipid syndrome. We quickly touched upon thrombolysis in the beginning. The role of thrombolysis in DVT is very limited, but there are still some indications where you want to consider thrombolysis. As you can see here, this is a patient with Phlegmasia cerulea dolens, which is a massive DVT in which the swelling in, that, in the involved limb impairs the arterial blood flow to, that, to the extremity and is actually a life-threatening emergency situation. So what are the indications for thrombolysis? Definitely phlegmasia cerulea dolens or a hemodynamically relevant PE, meaning a patient with a PE who is in shock, who is hypertensive. These are definitely indications for, uh, for thrombolysis. The role for thrombolysis in iliofemoral DVT is a little bit more controversial. And you always want to assess for contraindications to TPA because that's not a benign medication and has a substantial risk of major or even life-threatening bleeding complications. A Cochrane meta-analysis has shown that thrombolysis can be either 
applied systemically or as a catheter directed medication and the outcome for both of these modalities is equal. And one of the considerations for thrombolysis was that with thrombolysis the risk of the uh, occurrence of post-thrombotic syndrome can be reduced. However, the recent ATTRACT trial that was published in the New England Journal showed that the use of catheter-directed TPA did not uh, reduce the risk of um, post-thrombotic syndrome, but rather increased the risk of bleeding. So the role of thrombolysis in DVT still needs to be determined. The final question when you uh, discuss the treatment of DVT is how long does that patient need to be anticoagulated? Obviously you want to discontinue trigger factors and manage comorbidities and the optimal duration of anticoagulation is unknown. You always want to consider the risk of recurrence versus the risk of bleeding. So for patients who only had a transient risk factor uh, for a DVT, meaning a provoked DVT in the setting of a recent surgery or immobilization, Three months of anticoagulation should be sufficient, as their five-year recurrence rate can be as low as 3 to 15%. For an unprovoked DVT, you want to anticoagulate for at least three months, potentially even six months or longer in selected patients, as their risk of recurrence is substantially higher and can be as high as 30% within 10 years. For cancer patients, you also want to anticoagulate for at least six months or for as long as the cancer is active. Of note, cancer patients also have an increased risk of bleeding, so you want to carefully balance the risks and benefits of anticoagulation in these patients. So concluding this talk, uh, I want to provide you with a sample write-up for a patient with DVT. In your assessment, you always want to comment on whether that DVT was a provoked versus an unprovoked incident. And you also want to assess the disposition for that patient, if he or she can be managed as an outpatient or if admission to the inpatient service or even to the ICU would be the appropriate disposition. And that's based on hemodynamic stability, risk of bleeding while on anticoagulation and the individual comorbidities. In your plan, you want to specify what you need to monitor for the patient with a DVT on anticoagulation. If you started on heparin, you want to monitor PTT and platelet count. For warfarin, you want to mo monitor INR. And obviously, for all patients on anticoagulation, you want to monitor for signs and symptoms of bleeding. You want to discontinue triggering medications like oral contraceptives, testosterone, DVT can be painful, so you want to provide appropriate pain medications. Early mobilization and compression stockings are helpful, and early mobilization has not been shown to increase the risk of a pulmonary embolism. As we discussed, based on your assessment, whether it was a provoked and unprovoked DVT, the duration of anticoagulation is different. If you have an unprovoked DVT, you want to at least have a certain basic workup for in terms of cancer screening with age and sex appropriate screening, good history and physical exam as well as a chest x-ray. And you also want to comment on the need for thrombophilia screening, although this is a highly controversial topic. Finally, what are the key take-home points from this talk? If you're considering DVT on your differential, you want to risk stratify that patient with a scoring system. The most commonly used one is the well score. If your well score is 0 or 1, you have a low pretest probability for a DVT. So the next step would be to order a D-dimer, and if that's negative, you've ruled out a DVT. If your pretest probability for a DVT is high, meaning a well score of 2 or greater, you go ahead and order an ultrasound. DVT can often be managed as an outpatient. There are several regimens available, either low molecular weight heparin plus warfarin or DOEX for at least three months for a provoked DVT versus six months for an unprovoked DVT. There are criteria for admission or in thrombolysis that we discussed. Thrombophilia screening is still uncertain and should be 
considered on an individual basis. Importantly, for an unprovoked DVT, you always want to do at least a age and sex appropriate amount of cancer screening, as an unprovoked DVT can be the first sign of an underlying malignancy in up to 10% of patients. That wraps up this talk. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you gained a little bit from this talk. Here are some references that I would recommend for further reading, especially the first one is a good review on this topic. Thanks for joining us and I hope to see you soon for the next video in the Yale 20 lecture series.